I actually thought I was going to be speaking in March. I had a bad moment earlier in the week because I had a very busy week and busy weekend. And I was thinking, well, at least I have a little Saturday morning. I have a little uh, frame of time in which I don't have anything to do. And then I called Derek about something else. And Derek said, I'm glad you called. I want to talk about Saturday. I said, what? <laughs> What's Saturday? He said, you know you're going to speak to the men of St. Joseph. I thought that was March. So he was right. I checked. I actually hadn't even put it in my calendar at all. I had been neglectful. But I said, well, all right. I to think of what I can say. So, but I'm glad to be here. And as I was preparing to speak, I was praying about what to speak about. And I thought, well, why don't I look at the readings for today? I like to do that. You know, evangelists, if we meet evangelists, we have to talk about the good news. And the good news is fundamentally the gospel, so I always like to look to the gospel to see what wisdom can be found in there. So that's what I look to, and Father Paul gave me a really good lead-in, because he gave us the advice of recre recreating, recreating, of taking time to step away, to be open to the mystery of God's presence, God's love, and God's guidance. And there is actually a form of prayer that exemplifies this. And it's a form that maybe not talked about as much as some of the other forms of prayer. We call it contemplative prayer in the Catholic tradition. So what I, what I want to talk about this morning is Contemplative prayer in the call of fatherhood. When the men of St. Joseph, St. Joseph is a nearly perfect example of fatherhood. And he's a man who's also contemplative. You might not think of him that way. You might think of him more of an active sort of man. He's a carpenter, makes his living with his hands. But remember, he's very receptive to that mystery of of God, and he receives really vital advice several times in the gospel and dreams. He's, I think, a prime example of contemplative prayer, and he shows us how it's very actually closely aligned with, with fatherhood. <clears throat> now, just to give you a little background about prayer, you go to the catechism, and the catechism will talk about three expressions <clears throat> of prayer. The first is vocal, and that's the one we probably are most familiar with. And the Mass has a lot of vocal prayers that when we pray the rosary, that's an exercise in vocal prayer. Even sometimes when we pray, and we might not say words out loud, but we're going through words in our head. That's still actually a type of vocal prayer. And that's an essential component to prayer. The Catechism says that the need to involve the senses in interior prayer corresponds to a requirement of our human nature. We are body and spirit, and we experience the need to translate our feelings externally. So right, you can't really just drop vocal prayer out of one's prayer life. In fact, Jesus left us one prayer, and that is actually a vocal prayer. It's the Our Father. Right? And it's so telling that the one prayer he leaves us leads off with that phrase, Our Father. He could have picked any word. He had thousands of words to choose, and it's the Father that becomes the fundamental, critical word. But Jesus is also a contemplative. Okay, so we see him in today's gospel, as he so often does, seeking a deserted place. Except he's giving this advice to his apostles. Right? Come away by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. And he's telling the apostles to do something that he does a lot of. Again, if we look at the Gospels, Jesus is always seeking solitude. 
he's seeking to be able to step away from the noise, the incessant activity that often comes to characterize his ministry, and to spend time quietly with the Father. And if we don't do that, we don't grow in our awareness of God's fatherhood. And if we don't grow in the awareness of God's fatherhood, our own fatherhood, in whatever form it may take, whether it's the priesthood or father of a, of a biological family, our own fatherhood stagnates when it's not being continuously renewed by the encounter with God's fatherhood of us. Right, we're only good fathers, and I don't have biological children, I'm a single man, but my ministry, there's an element of fatherhood in it. Not full blown, but there is an element of fatherhood. That's why I include myself. But we're good fathers to the extent that we experience the goodness of our own heavenly father. It's not something we can't produce our own fatherhood. We participate in God's fatherhood. And contemplative prayer is a concrete way to deepen our own participation in God's fatherhood. And it really enlivens our mission of fatherhood. In fact, it may be a, it's a foundation stone, I would argue. And a great example of that is actually today's saint, Saint Jerome Emiliani. Because Jerome was born in the last half of the 15th century, and he loses his own biological father at a young age. He's probably in his early teens, I'd say around 13. His own father dies, and this sparked something of a crisis in his life, right? I think he really found himself without any moorings anymore. He didn't know his questions of identity, who am I, where do I belong, really started to crowd in on him, as they can do for us. And when he was 15, he ran away from home to join the military, because he thought, well, I can maybe find my identity there. Right, I'll find my identity in military glory. That's what I'll be. And he was fairly successful at that, but eventually he <coughs> met catastrophic failure, and he lost the fortress he was in charge of, and he was imprisoned by the forces that captured the fortress he was defending. And it was there that the conversion Father Paul mentioned started to happen. And that conversion started to happen in a contemplative experience. You might say, well, that's a strange place to have a contemplative experience in prison. Well, actually, in one way, it's not, because he wasn't able to do all the things he was used to doing. The activities that had filled his life, he was really forcibly removed from them. And he didn't have anything to do. I mean, he was just languishing in a prison cell. So he had to <laughs> let go of a lot of things. He had to get comfortable with a silence that he probably had been fleeing most of his young adult life. So that's where his life changes direction. And it, I argue, I said again, it's a contemplative experience. And let's just look at what contemplation is. Uh, the Catechism, by the way, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it's available for free online, the whole thing, if you go to the Vatican website. And the section on prayer is just bloom, it's wonderful. It's beautifully written and full of great insight. But this is what some of the things that it says about contemplative prayer. Well, what is contemplative prayer? St. Teresa of Avila answers, Contemplative prayer, in my opinion, is nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. And again, contemplative prayer is the prayer of the child of God, of the forgiven sinner, who agrees to welcome the love by which he is loved, and who wants to respond to it by loving even more. The forgiven sinner who agrees to welcome the love by which he is loved. So you'll notice when it talks about other forms of prayer, like vocal or the 
third type is meditative prayer, there's always some sort of action that we perform. In meditative prayer, we often will look at a text and we will try to sort of plug the text into our lives and say, How does, what does this say about my life, my own walk with Christ? When they describe contemplative prayer, there's, no, there's not much description of what you're going to do. Right? Because in contemplative prayer, we really open ourselves to what God is going to do. Right? And to tie in again to Father Paul's talk, unfortunately, a lot of times, even when we get physical space for silence, we carry a lot of noise in our minds into that space. Right? It may, there may not be anything we can hear with our ears, but there's stuff constantly going on in our minds and in our hearts that really get in the way of this recreating, this contemplative experience. And contemplative prayer, in part, helps us to get through that inner noise that really robs us of the encounter with the Father's love that informs our own human fatherhood. And well, how does that how does that happen, you might ask? What what do I do? What do I do to have this experience? Well, that's actually the wrong question. As long as we're focused on what we do, the contemplative experience, contemplative prayer does not actually occur. Because in contemplation, we relinquish our doing and open ourselves to God's doing. And the first and hardest thing, I think, is to let go of the desire to do something, to create the experience, to set the parameters of it. And I think that humility is really the key here to this contemplative prayer experience. And we get a wonderful example of it in the first reading from the Book of Kings, right? So Solomon has this dream, and he, in the dream he dialogues with God. That'd be a great dream. I don't think I can cite a dream of my own where I dialogue with God. Hopefully it happens. <laughs> uh, but God gives them this, you know, this sort of genie in a bottle moment. What do you want? And there's a humility that Solomon exemplifies here because Solomon doesn't, Solomon could define himself lots of ways. He could say, well, I'm going I'm to be a builder. I'm going to define myself by my achievements. And he does become a great builder, but at this moment, he said, no, he's not going to say, God, make me the, <clears throat> the best builder in the world. You know, give me the ability to outstrip the Egyptians in their own buildings. Now, he doesn't define himself by his achievements, by what he's going to build up. He could have chosen to define himself in, in sort of in competition with others. He could have said, make me a great military commander, like my father David was. Right? And that's always a temptation to define ourselves in contradiction to others. I'm better than so-and-so. That competitive urge. That's something that has to be really looked at, are we trying to define ourselves by being better than others? Solomon doesn't do that. Solomon instead looks at his own inadequacy and takes a hard, honest <coughs> look at it. He says, I'm a mere youth, not knowing at all how to act. I serve you in the midst of a people whom you have chosen, a people so vast it cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding heart. So what happens in the silence of Solomon's inner life that we see demonstrated to us in the dream is he encounters his own inadequacy. And that's something silence is a great teacher of. And that's why so many people flee silence. I can't tell you the numbers of especially young men, maybe late teens, early 20s, they tell me, I, I can't... I can't stand it if it's silent. I have to turn the radio on. I have to fill this. I have to be watching something. I have to be doing something. And I always say, what? Why can't you sit in silence? What's so uncomfortable about it? 
It's because silence is convicting of our inadequacy. <clears throat> and to be human, in a sense, we are, I like to say, tragically inadequate. And Solomon comes to grips with that. And that's a, the first step in contemplative prayer, is sitting in the silence, but instead of thinking, what do I have to do? What am I going to do here to be honest and say, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. Maybe I have a lot of things in my life that I can't seem to get a handle on. <clears throat> maybe it's habitual sin. Uh, maybe it's relationships with other people. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the virtue to deal with this. Help me, God. That's a, actually a first step in, in, the, in the contemplative experience of God because we become open to his presence and we let go of the myth that we can fix things, that we can forge our own identity through achievement or through competition. So that's getting over the initial anxiety that often permeates the first moments of silence, the anxiety that <laughs> tends to push us towards doing something which is really a way of squirming out of the encounter with God. Um, so Solomon gives us a, a great piece of advice there. And then, after we've done that, and in humility opened ourselves to the presence of God, that's a letting God take over. And what's going to happen after that, I can't tell you, because that has to do with your relationship with God. It's going to be quite personal, but the form it will take is, this is where we hear God's voice so clearly that he loves us, and that he's going to even pray within us, pray for us. Um, and this is, again, to go on in the catechism, it says, but he knows that the love he is returning is poured out by the Spirit in his heart. For everything is grace, everything is grace from God. <laughs> Contemplative prayer is the poor and humble surrender to the loving will of the Father, an ever deeper union with his beloved Son. See, this is so often our approach to God is very what I like to call mercantile. <laughs> Okay, it's, there, it's infected with a this for that sort of mentality. Okay, God, I'll give you this amount of time, and then I expect you to bring order to my life in these different ways. Or, I'm going to increase my prayer life, and therefore I should feel better. I should have a greater sense of peace, or a greater success, X, Y, and Z. Well, contemplative prayer starts to get us beyond that. Because God wants us. He doesn't want our stuff. He doesn't want to be some sort in some sort of a mercantile relationship where we're trading goods. He wants us. And he wants to sit with us. He wants simply to be with us. Not for any further goal, just to be with us. Contemplative prayer is the most intense, in, uh, in a way, the most intense form of that being because we surrender our own agendas and we can listen to God in the silence and the mission of fatherhood right because fatherhood fatherhood is really if you boil it down fatherhood is a way of loving it's a form of love and there is no loving apart from participating in God's life God is love and Love grows, I would argue, out of silence, out of this contemplative encounter. St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, one of the best examples of what we might consider active love, we might not see Mother Teresa and think, well, she's contemplative. Well, she spent multiple hours a day in front of the Blessed Sacrament, so actually, yes. But this is what she had to say about it. She said, Prayer is a fruit of silence. She said, prayer is a fruit of silence. Faith is a fruit of prayer. And love is a fruit of faith. Right? So you start with silence, move to prayer, move to faith, and then you move to love. 
But that was how Mother Teresa understood that connection, that chain that starts in the silence. And the more we get knocked off that base, resting in the silent love of God, the less able we are to love, the less, the more frustrated I argue we're going to become in our mission, our missions of fatherhood. And it's the mission of fatherhood comes first from being loved by God, from experience of God's love. So to go back to the saint, Jerome of Miliani, when he's in prison and he doesn't have anything to do, I don't think he doesn't have anything to read even, he's really in trouble. And in that silence, he encounters the love of God. And this sends his life, this is where his mission grows from, his awareness of mission. What's God calling me to do? Who am I going to love? The seed is planted in that prison, in that contemplative experience. And he, he actually escapes from prison, and he takes his chains and lays them down before a statue of Mary. But he was symbolizing not so much physical chains, but spiritual chains that had really wrapped themselves around his heart. Right, around his maybe capitalizing on his own woundedness, his own struggles to find identity, maybe in part because of the loss of his father at such a young age. And he then is able to become a father himself. He becomes a priest, and he has this great heart for orphans and for abandoned children, and he starts homes for them. But it's God's love flowing from the silence into the action of fatherhood. That's the fundamental thing you see in the life of Jerome of Miliani. And he actually becomes the patron saint of orphans and abandoned children. Somebody who started as a child maybe feeling abandoned with the loss of his father, but by the encounter of the love of God in contemplation, it took a prison cell for him to become contemplative. I would encourage you not to have to make God go to those extremes in your own lives. Um, but um, we, we could ask ourselves, how can we replicate that in our own lives? And again, this is where putting time aside, you know, it might, you might I'm sure you all, we, we have very busy lives. The pace of our modern world is very fast, ever greater velocity, but we all need to put time aside, we all need to go to the deserted places, right, because if we don't do that, our missions as fathers and our ability to love will be lessened and lessened and lessened because we're forgetting to experience the love of God and participate more and more concretely in it. So contemplative prayer, that put time aside, and then learning to go beyond what's often an initial anxiety with silence, especially if you're a younger man. I mean, I think that's a, that's a great struggle. But to sit comfortably and acknowledge that God loves us and not because of anything we do. He loves us because he made us. He sees in us his own image. Um, so we encounter love, and the less we encounter love, the less we communicate love. So I just love the last lines. When Jesus disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them. For they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. <coughs> Right? And he encounters this crowd as he himself seeks silence, as he himself seeks solitude, as he strives to enter into contemplative prayer. Right? So fitting that this example of profound love comes in this moment where he's seeking God and he re realizes, well, for me in this moment, the face of God is this crowd and I have to be with them. So contemplative prayer in no way competes with concretely loving those we're called to be responsible for. Jesus shows us that. Sometimes people, I think, get nervous because they think that it's not something that's integrated into a life of active love. 
But in fact, if we look at the Gospels, we'll show that that's not at all the case. Right? That Jesus lives a life where he seeks contemplative encounter with God, but loves his fellow brothers and sisters perfectly. Right? That's a great mark of the balance that contemplation brings into our lives. So, I just want to end by going back to the Catechism. And sharing with you this beautiful line which ties it back into fatherhood and what we can expect from the contemplative encounter with God. It says that contemplative prayer is silence, the symbol of the world to come, or silent love. In this silence, unbearable to the outer man, the Father speaks to us his incarnate word, who suffered, died, and rose. In this silence, the spirit of adoption enables us to share in the prayer of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I yeah. Got one. When you, sometimes I go off to, well, not sometimes, pretty regularly I'll go to the Adoration Chapel, and even though I'm in that silence, uh, there's a lot going on. Right. Even though you're not speaking anything. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any uh, advice on how to silence the, uh, the, the chaos or the, the right. thoughts that you're constantly speaking to God about when you should be or when you're working on uh, quieting yourself to listen? Um, okay, yeah, I can maybe give a couple pointers that I found helpful. Um, one is sometimes, and I've had this happen, I get really fixated on quieting that uh, inner noise. And it creates more inner noise because <laughs> it's something I, I'm trying to do and then, then it becomes this whole little campaign of mine. <laughs> um, so sometimes it's better to resist the urge to try to fix the problem of the inner noise because that can often, like I said, tie into the problem. And to just sort of let it be and just not really fight with it, just let it pass by. Sometimes I find doing that, and it will pass by, and then it lessens, and lessens some more, and then sometimes it's gone. Not always, but sometimes it's gone. That first step is not, not trying to launch a campaign to eradicate it. Uh, secondly, sometimes a mantra can be helpful, and we think of that term in Eastern spirituality, but uh, imagine just something like what I will say is, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Something that takes something that Jesus said, and that can focus <laughs> us in the right place. I love that one because it's a expression of trying of trying to be open. Right? If you say, Well, I'm having trouble being open, I have all this noise and all these preoccupations. Well, at least if I start saying Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. I have the right, the right words on my lips, the right frame of mind in some sense, and I'll say that over and over again. Um, and those are two things that I found helpful. So not launching a campaign to eradicate the inner noise, and then finding a mantra from Jesus that really moves us towards that sort of openness that he exemplifies. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Derek, and Father Paul.